Uh, last year, the highlight of our defense forum was hearing from Palmer Lucky, and um, I have to admit, we, we felt so, so lucky to have Palmer Lucky come last year that we didn't even think about having him back. And uh, I was visiting with Palmer in my office a few months ago, and he asked about the forum and, and said, uh, well, do, I, do I get to come back? And I thought, of course. So he said, so we invited him to come back, and he immediately responded and said that he would come back for the second annual uh, Northeast Indiana Defense Forum. So we're, we're very glad and honored to have Palmer Lucky with us here again, um, who has some very important uh, announcements to make uh, that we're excited about for our great state. But I also thought it would be great to have Gary Dick. Um, all of you have seen him on TV, the important work that he does to highlight uh, Indiana business um, with the, now with the Indianapolis Business Journal, Inside Indiana Business. So I asked Gary Dick to come and interview Palmer Lucky, and we're very proud to have both of you close out our second annual defense forum. Thank you for joining us. Palmer, how are you? I'm doing good, except I'm in California time. Okay, okay. well, it's better to be on Indiana time. A lot, lot, lot going on here. Really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Uh, this is an industry, uh, defense, aerospace, that we cover a lot uh, on Inside Indiana Business. Uh, Crane was mentioned, so many companies, organizations. The impact on the economy here is so substantial. And the fact that you're interested in actually doing deals here in Indiana uh, is very positive on a number of fronts. And you announced a big deal this week. Uh, talk about that. Purdue Research Park Company, a startup that has uh, been making some headlines. Talk about that acquisition. Yeah, so the news just broke, uh, just, just broke, uh, you know, a, a day ago that we purchased Adranos. It's a solid rocket motor company that started here at Purdue. They still have a presence here in Indiana. Uh, they've also got a, got a couple other sites that they've, that they've, that they've built up. Um, they're a solid rocket motor company that has some really advanced technology that allows you to have longer range and a more compact size, and then also some innovations on the manufacturing side that allow you to make solid rocket motors more cost effectively, more reliably, and to really scale them in a huge way. Uh, and so the reason we bought them, we, we love the team, we love the technology, uh, but w our goal is to scale them into one of the largest providers of solid rocket motors so that Andrel can make uh, you know, rocket motors, not just for our products, but also for all of the other companies that so desperately need these things. I mean, we're talking about from small, small size, you know, things like Javelin and Stinger, you know, size, size rocket motors, all the way up to tactical missiles. It's one of the critical gaps in our strategic supply chain is ability to manufacture rocket motors at scale. So that, that was why we got into it. It's, it's not uh, necessarily the coolest thing that, that, you, that, that people imagine. You know, they think, oh, aren't you guys working on AI and you know, autonomous fighter planes and all those things? And that's cool. But uh, solid rocket motors, the motors themselves, is one of the things that I think our, our country most needs competition and, and increased supply chain on. So you see a real opportunity there. So it sounds like you're looking at this acquisition uh, as something that can, that can grow in Indiana, oh, absolutely, and I think you know it's going to be it's going to be Indiana, and it's it's going to be uh, in Mississippi, and uh, you know just being being candid. I mean, I'm a California guy. It's going to grow every, pretty much everywhere except California. <laughs> Talk a little bit about that because you you have done business uh, and continue to do business in Indiana. What is it that you see here in the state that makes it attractive from a business standpoint? Well, the first thing is you've got a lot of really good companies, and some of them are ones that we're already working with that I can't talk about. Other ones are ones that we want to work with, and we've been having some of those discussions, and there's a few of you out there who, who know what I'm talking about. Um, so you've got a lot of really great companies with great technology. You've got a really great workforce that I think is probably more uh, generally ideologic, ideologically aligned with most of America rather than kind of the crazy stuff that you have to deal with in uh, California and even tech hubs in places like Texas or you know, there, there's a, the, the U.S. tech industry is interesting because it's centralized in California and has really, that's on the education side, on the, on the incorporation side, the investment side. And, but, and they always pride themselves on being the first to see what's coming next. And I think when it comes to the reality of modern warfare and modern geopolitics, they were the last to see what was coming. You know, this was a group that largely did not expect that Russia would invade Ukraine. They, didn't, they really did not expect that China would become more and more aggressive towards Taiwan and others. Um, and I'd, I'd say you don't see that kind of uh, 
head in the sand thinking in places like Indiana. And I, I said this last year too, but you know, it's nice to have uh, representatives uh, like, 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 like Jim Banks who are, who are in the mix versus, I mean, for example, the, the congressman who represented my district uh, during the last election cycle ran attack ads against me. I mean, that's that, I'm, I'm not even really? a politician. I'm really? just a business wow. guy. Um, you know, it, it, it wasn't really to go after me. It was to say Palmer's this horrible guy. He's a crazy extremist. He's a supporter of domestic terrorism, and he donated to my opponent. Um, but you know, it, yeah. and it, it's one of those things where it's, it really helps to have someone who doesn't attack the biggest businesses in their district. And I like, I, I know that sounds like really obvious. You know, yes. why, why Indiana? Well, the, the politicians don't attack you on TV. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But yeah. That, <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. Good. And don't, all, don't take it for granted. Yeah. Andrew, I'll talk about so many people are familiar with you and your business, but you, it's growing and you're into so many different areas. Give us a thumbnail description of the company. I mean, so Andrew is a defense product company. We use our own money to decide what to build, what to research and development, research and develop, and then we build products in collaboration with the government. We, we, we sell them to them. And one of the things that I think is really important about our business model is that we generally are using a lot, we put more of our own money into researching and developing our products than the government does. So we've always got our skin in the game. We're always looking over our shoulder, wondering what's gonna happen if we, if we fail, if we're inefficient. And that, that, that's led to, a, I think, a really good dynamic internally. I always tell my employees that it's good to live in fear. And uh, that, that's what drives you to drive, drives you to be efficient. But you know, our, our core product is an AI system called Lattice. It is the software that powers all the hardware systems that we make. And so we make autonomous aerial vehicles, ground vehicles, underwater vehicles, a lot of uh, s uh, unmanned sensing systems. Uh, we also partner with other companies, so we're building Lattice into things that we don't make as well. So it was just uh, the news just broke like 18 hours ago that we were selected for phase two along with American Rheinmetall on the OMFV program, although it's not optionally manned fighting vehicle now, it's the mechanized infantry combat vehicle, something like that. I, 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 don't, I don't remember it, they just changed the name a few hours ago. Um, but you know, the, our, our goal is to try and bring autonomy to as much of the defense apparatus as possible so that people can do what people are good at and machines can do what machines are good at. There's a lot of jobs that don't need to be done by people where machines can micromanage it second to second in, in, in a better way. Yeah. Um, your company's products are supporting uh, the Ukrainians uh, in their war with Russia. Um, have there been lessons learned uh, in that exercise for you and, and, and your company? There definitely have. I mean, so we've been involved in that conflict since the very beginning. So we've had Android products in, in Ukraine since the second week of the war. Um, and I've, 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 I've been to Ukraine, but I'd say actually the biggest lessons we've learned, uh, we've learned a lot of lessons I'd say on the engineering side. You know, how do you actually go up against modern electronic warfare systems? How do you avoid reliance on navigation and communication systems that are often the weakest link in a lot of these modern, modern defense systems? But a lot of the biggest lessons I think are even fr uh, from, from before the conflict even started. Uh, you know, the first time I met Zelensky was not after the war, I've, and I've met him since, but before the war, right after he was elected, he actually reached out to Andrew because of the work we do with U.S. Uh, with, with, uh, US, US Border Patrol. So we do a lot of work with CBP on the U.S. southern border, building automated sensor towers that are deployed along hundreds of miles of the border, and he read a Wired Magazine article about how bad we are for doing that, and he said, I love these guys, I need to get these border towers on my border. And uh, it, was, it, it was really interesting because the U.S. position at the time was that they did not want to allow that to happen because Russia wasn't going to invade Ukraine, that it, wasn't, they, it was just saber rattling, and that we didn't want to give these tools to Ukraine lest it did provoke Russia into uh, taking action. And looking back, I'd say that the, the, the lesson there was that, uh, was that optimism kills. You know, that, that we, I really wish we could go back in time, and I wish that I could go back in time and that I would have used more of my you know, political points and more of my public pressure points to try and make that happen because it would have made a material difference, especially in the opening days of the conflict. If we had known when and where people were coming across and been able to, to provide targeting information to long range fires, to aircraft, it would have been a game changer. And, uh, but unfortunately, I kind of fell into the same trap where I was like, Russia's not actually gonna do that, that's nuts. And uh, so I like to say that I saw where things were going, but I, in some ways, I, I, I'm just along for the ride too. What was that like, meeting Zelensky? I mean, that, that had to be an experience. Well, the, I mean, you, uh, the, 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 he's a really, really charismatic guy. 
I mean, on another level, like you, you would not believe, which you would expect, you know, he was an entertainer and he was a comedian and he was an actor. And so that was, that was his craft, was the ability to connect with people and to, and, and to be the thing that, that he needs to be. Uh, and so when I first met him, I'll, I'll be totally honest, I didn't take him that seriously. And I wish that I could say, oh man, I, I knew that this guy, he was going to really rise to the occasion. But remember, he had just been elected. He was seen as kind of the comedian who managed to get his way into, in, into their White House. Um, and I did not take him as serious as I should have. I think since the war has started, it's become very clear that he is someone who is exactly who Ukraine needed in, in, in that role. Um, to the point where I, I would, there are people who said, oh man, maybe it'd be better if we have another military planner in, in, in that role. And I think, you know what? I, I think that what that country has needed uh, is, is somebody who is able to you know, be the face of Ukraine internationally and also internally to his people. And he's done an extraordinary job of that along with all of the actual nuts and bolts of trying to run a war against the Russians, which you know, anyone who doesn't like him, and I've, I've run into these people from time to time, and they criticize how he did this, how he did that. I say, you know, when was the last time you had to run a war against Russia? You know, you think you'd do better? Uh, and some of them think they, they would, which, uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know about that. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, from a competitive standpoint, um, you're in an industry with a lot of old line, uh, traditional, big companies. You're a disruptor. Right? How, how do you compete uh, in that environment with those, those traditional old line industries? Uh, how does that work? Well, there's two sides to this. One of them is we compete with them by building systems that we think are better, we think they're uh, faster to field, we think that they're more closely aligned with what the customer needs. The flip side of that is we're also not always competing with them. I mean, we're partnering with a lot of these companies on a lot of things. We work with all of the major primes in, in, in one capacity or, in, or another. I'd say, you know, when, when, I, when, I, when I started this company uh, six years ago, I was maybe uh, less practical on that. And I, I, I was definitely more in, in, in the mindset of trying to, uh, you know, trying to destroy trying to destroy the system that was incentivizing these guys to become like that. And the, the reality is a lot of these companies, the reason they're slow, the reason they are in the mold that they are, is because of the incentives that the government has created for them. They are products of those incentives. And so, for, for example, you have a contracting system that rewards certain types of behavior that happens to be slower. You're going to get more of it. Uh, the, the, the positive side of that is we're seeing more incentives that reward the faster behavior, that reward self-investment, that reward internal research and development dollars, that reward companies that think with a product approach and how they're going to build things at scale. And so I, I think that the zeitgeist has changed to a certain degree. I'd say we're moving a lot faster, but also the companies that we're working with that have traditionally been very slow, they're getting the incentive and contracting structures they need to also be motivated to move quickly. There's no reason they inherently have to move slow. Artificial intelligence, I can think of few people better qualified uh, to provide perspective on that than you. You know, so, so much attention being placed on, on AI, you know, is it going to be the end of uh, civilization? I mean, you hear all these daily reports, regulation, number of ways we can go there. But as you look at artificial intelligence, where things are now, today, and where things are happening ahead of your perspective. All right, I've got a lot of thoughts on this, so I don't know how many I'll be able to hit, but I'm mostly just very angry about it, so uh, I'll, 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 I'll try to get through them. First of all, there's people that are saying that the United States needs to sign a six-month, like, there was this big open letter from a bunch of tech companies saying we need to sign a six-month moratorium on the development and deployment of new artificial intelligence technology. There's a few reasons that I'm not a fan of that. One, I think militarily, and strategically, that's a disaster because nobody anywhere is actually going to stop. Uh, the only people who would actually stop would be this, these handful of commercial tech companies in the, United, in the United States. But let's ignore all of that. Regulating AI in that way is just modern book burning. I mean, you, there were people when the printing press was invented who thought that it needed to be regulated because it would allow people to uh, spread misinformation too effectively, that it would allow people to rile people up, that it would be able to influence elections unduly due to this new technology that the government hadn't figured out how to regulate fast. Does that sound familiar? And so the, the, it, to the idea that you would, you know, that people never complain about the first, first book that burns. The problem is when you build a government authority that is allowed to regulate how people use technology in this way, it inevitably gets applied to more and more and more and more and more things. I mean, I mean, you actually, if this sounds crazy, you look at how 
the United Kingdom, you know, or you know, b b back then the British monarchy did regulate the printing press over there. They actually did say, you, you know, you need a license for that, mate, because you needed a license to have a printing press. They said, this is too dangerous. We can't allow just any company to just go printing pamphlets. Who knows how it could be used? And so that, that, uh, that's one of my big picture problems with regulating AI. Getting into the nitty gritty of the military applications, another problem that you have is people who are looking at AI in defense as a new thing. They think that it is this new thing and that they are hearing about for the first time and the only context they have for criticism is Terminator. And they, they, they assume that having watched Terminator and watched CNN for 30 minutes, you know, they're really actually well equipped to criticize how the military might use AI. The, the reality is AI is just a new tool that continues a long tradition of autonomous weapons in the military. There's all kinds of defensive systems that are shooting down incoming rocket fire, incoming mortar fire, totally autonomously. You look at landmines. What are those but autonomous weapons? Uh, you can even go back thousands of years to the point where the Chinese was building pit traps where you could have normal troops go across them and only collapse once you had people who were on horses that they wanted to capture come in. You know, the, the, the guys who are higher up. And they actually had an uh, a weapon that was the opposite. It was poisoned uh, spikes that they would put on the ground. They would punch through the thin shoes of the low-level infantrymen, but not the better shoes of the, of, of the officers that were in charge. And those are clearly autonomous weapons designed through in engineering intent to decide who to kill, who to not. And there are people who want the military to commit to never allowing a system to autonomously decide whether it's going to strike a target or not. And to me, that is crazy. It is immoral, it is ahistorical. There is no moral high ground in making sure that landmines are unable to differentiate between, let's say, a Russian tank and a school bus. I think that if you can make it decide whether it's going to blow up very reliably against the right target, that is unequivocally a moral good. Now, like, so that's why we cannot commit to not incorporating AI into these weapon systems at the level where it will prevent collateral damage, where it will increase precision, where it will make us more powerful. And then the final argument is, well, what if it kills all of us? And I think that there's a lot of things that are gonna kill all of us before AI. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm way more concerned about garage-engineered bioweapons than uh, super intelligent AI that on its own decides that it's going to kill us. I'd also say, mediocre AI in the hands of evil people is a lot more concerning to me over the next 10, 20, 30 years than a hypothetical super intelligent AI. So look, it's on the list of things that could kill us all, but I'd say it's so far down the list that we should probably keep our priorities straight. Anyway, I've got like 10 other things I could say, but I'll cut, I'll cut myself off there. Yeah, well, having said that, how do you anticipate, what form do you anticipate regulation happening? I hope I hope that it is going to be a, ma be a matter of regulation by the bodies that are using these things. For example, the DOD is the leader globally in AI regulation in terms of how autonomous systems are used. This is why it frustrates me so much when you have, and I deal with this with the press all the time. They say, well, you know, how, yeah, how, yeah, how should the DOD be thinking about developing regulations for the use of autonomous weapons? I said, what are you talking about? They already have them. They were deploying radiation-seeking missiles in Vietnam that were able to go to a target, see what RF signals was putting out, and decide if it was going to strike or not. I mean, they're, they're so far down the path. They've been thinking about this for decades. They've been acting on it for decades. Uh, that is a level of regulation I like. What I don't like is this idea that Congress or some other body, you know, God forbid it's the FCC or, the, you know, is going to come along and say, actually, we're going to be in charge of how you're able to use AI to communicate ideas. You're in charge of how you're going to use AI to make movies, to make art. You're, we're you know, we're going to be in charge of how AI is used to do just about anything. I think that it needs to be very limited. I'm, I'm for example, if the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration wants to put together regulations for AI in autonomous vehicles, I think that that's fine. If you're talking about a body, say, saying, we have the authority to make this technology broadly across all industries illegal for the next six months on the authority of the government and not the people, that, that terrifies me. And I think that if you give any agency that authority, you are opening up the door for very scary things to happen down the road. Have you seen any examples of AI going, going too far? <sighs> too far? I mean, there's things, probably the best examples are actually what China's doing with it. I mean, it, you know, it's not the AI, it's, it is what you do with it. So, you know, China has 
uh, extraordinarily powerful AI surveillance regime that they're building. So building tools that are fusing severe security camera footage with data provided by their telecommunication systems, which is even fused with the data that is uh, you know, at the payment terminals at their shopping markets. They're able to build, using AI, these perfect profiles of what citizens are doing, what they're buying, who they're talking to, where they were, not just for real-time analysis, but going back in time analysis. Then what they're trying to do is build a perfect police state that makes dissent impossible and resistance impossible. Possible. And I'm not talking about resistance like anti-terrorism resistance. I'm talking about resistance like, you know, an offhand comment to your buddy like, man, can you believe what that guy said on TV the other day? They want to make sure that you can't even do that safely and to have a chilling effect. But more scary than that is that China, through companies like SenseTime, they have these domestic companies building these AI capabilities. In the same way the Soviets got a lot of countries on board by giving them weapon systems that allowed dictators to keep themselves in power as long as they did what the Soviet wants, Soviets want. China is delivering AI surveillance technologies to countries in Asia, to countries in Africa, with the exact same intent. They're saying, we're going to provide you with the tools you need to build a totalitarian police state that allows you to control your people. And if you ever fall out of line, we're going to turn it all off and they're going to kill you. Uh, and that, that is extraordinarily dangerous because not only is it changing the way that these countries think about ideas like individual liberty, freedom of speech, the right to self-govern, but they're also giving them the tools to make dissent and revolution absolutely impossible. And then the worst part of it at the end of the day is, you know, if I'm an African warlord who's only in power because I'm using sense time products provided for free by the CCP to maintain control of my population, I'm going to do exactly what China says every time they... Uh, they call me on my phone because I know that the second that I do what they don't want, they're going to turn everything off and I, the dictator that everyone actually hates, is going to get killed. Are, are, there, are there lines? So that, that's, that's too far. That, yeah, that's too far. Gotcha. Let's, let's not yeah. use AI like that. Yeah. Lines that Anderal would not cross? There are lines that we wouldn't cross, but I, I, I always am loath to draw those lines. I don't want to sound like I'm just like in the pocket of the deep state or something, but like the, the reality is that a lot of people, they want specifics. You're like generally, are there lines I wouldn't cross? Sure, there are lines I wouldn't cross. There's countries I wouldn't work with. There's capabilities I wouldn't build. But those lines really shouldn't be drawn by me. They should be drawn by the democratically elected leaders that we vote for because they're accountable to the people. They're the ones who can be voted out. We can't have U.S. foreign policy de facto dictated by corporate executives. Imagine if Google was doing more work with the military. Imagine if Apple was doing more work with the military. Imagine if they really needed capabilities going to a certain area, a certain country, and then a handful of corporate executives say, no. We refuse. We refuse to turn on those systems. We're going to shut off all of those servers. We're the ones who are in charge of U.S. foreign policy, in charge of U.S. military policy, whatever you say in the Pentagon. That would be a disaster. And I'll give you one example of many I could give. It's a safer one. Uh, and there's probably, uh, people are going to hear this, and they're going to think in their minds what the unsafer ones are. Um, you, you look, people say, well, would you commit to not working with, uh, let's say, Turkey, you know, because they're, they're an authoritarian regime that happens to be a member of NATO, by the way. And I say, listen, that's at the end of the day up to the United States, uh, you know, the United States government. If the State Department, if the military told me that I need to provide things to Turkey, I'm going to really have to do it without question. Uh, because they're the ones who have the responsibility to make the right call there. And like one example of this was, uh, you know, a decade, about a decade ago, when a lot of people were giving a ton of shit to a handful of military contractors for providing security systems to the Turkish Air Force and pro for protecting a handful of airfields. They said, I can't believe you're doing this. I can't believe you're selling missiles to Turkey. I can't believe that you're equipping these guys who are doing all these bad things to their people, who are doing all of these things that I don't approve of. The reason that they were doing it didn't come out till years later. It was because we were storing a bunch of nuclear weapons on that Turkish airbase. Now, the government can't go out and necessarily say that. It's, it, this is all public now, and I'm not, I'm not saying anything I'm not supposed to. But they couldn't at the time go out and say, hey, CNN, stop giving us so much shit. Of course we need to defend these airbases where U.S. nuclear weapons are. There's no moral high ground either in allowing people to overrun an airfield and steal 100 nuclear weapons. Um, but at the same time, those companies were not even necessarily being told that. They weren't being told, here's what your things are being used for. They were told, listen, you have to trust us. We have the intel. We are the ones who are accountable for this decision. And to a certain degree, you need to go along with our lead. And so when it comes to the lines of who we would sell to, what we would sell, what we would build, 
I think it shouldn't be up to me. And uh, that also, you know, I know that's, that's an easy way for me to abdicate responsibility, but I also think that's the right thing for our country. It's the right model for our country. And if anyone who says differently, any executive who does say, yes, there's hard lines that I draw and I will cut off people who do things that I don't want, I, if I were in the military, I'd be really skeptical of that person as a person who should be building critical systems because you don't know what they're going to do. You mentioned China. Uh, due to China's uh, military buildup in air, sea, land, cyber capabilities as well, national security experts have uh, certainly become concerned that the U.S. could lose in an armed conflict uh, with China. How is uh, Anderall helping the U.S. build its arsenal so that very thing does not happen? Well, we're pulling people out of a lot of other industries that don't matter nearly so much. You know, all the people who are building all the, you know, augmented reality emojis for Snapchat and, and the like and putting them to work on stuff that matters more. And I, I think that that, you know, that that was really the crux of my company. I mean, when I, my, my previous company, Oculus VR, which I sold to Facebook, we were in the entertainment space and we were part of the problem. We were very dependent on China. We manufactured millions of virtual reality headsets in China. We couldn't have done it without them. And we didn't work with the military because we were afraid that there would be backlash on, in China that we would not be able to manage. This is a problem with Facebook, this is a problem with Google, this is a problem with Apple, our most powerful and innovative technology companies, which have many of our best engineers in, uh, you know, working for them, are not working with the US military to the extent that they should or could, some of them to an extent of zero. And there's never been a point in US history where this is the case. Imagine if in the run-up to World War II, if General Electric and Westinghouse and RCA had made the same position. Imagine if they had said that Imperial Japan was just too good of a revenue opportunity for them to, to pass up. Imagine if you had had that during the Cold War, if you had had, again, our most innovative companies. Imagine if Bell had said, you know, I, I think that we don't really want to take sides on this. We're not going to work with the US military because you know, we really think that you know, communism versus capitalism, who's to say really what's better? We're an international mega corporation that doesn't pick sides. Um, you know, I, I'd say we're trying to get people out of companies that have those incentives and into a company that wins when America wins. What um, authorities do companies like uh, Anderall need to ensure that uh, the D DOD can get more swift access to emerging technologies that, uh, like you, you talk about and you're involved with, uh, that they need to stay, uh, stay ahead of the game, stay ahead of their adversaries? You know, I'm going to say something that people are going to disagree with me on, and that's fine. I, I, I don't think we actually, strictly speaking, need more authorities or different authorities. And of course, there, 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 there are many, many uh, counterexamples, and there's here and there things where we do need different authorities. But I think there's too many companies, especially my peers, basically like new defense startups, that go out and they whine about the problem being the authorities and the legal process. They say, if only the authorities were different, if only the process was different for procurement, then I would be successful and I'd be able to sell my stuff. And what I tell them privately all the time is, guys, if you actually make things that they do desperately need, if it's a priority for the Pentagon and it's a priority for Congress and you are actually doing a great job, the authorities exist. They can buy it. It's, a, it, it's an excuse. Yes, it could be easier to buy them, but the reality is the existing authorities allow the government to do almost anything if the will exists. If they want to use the existing authorities to buy things, for the most part, if Congress is on board and if the Pentagon is on board, they can do almost anything. I was at a uh, procurement conference, uh, actually, uh, for, for the Air Force, two years in a row, and they wanted me to give a, give a talk on what the government is doing wrong in the procurement process. And uh, I, I, it, I, I, during the Q&A period, someone asked about, about OTAs, other transactional authorities, and they said, well, you know, are, are OTAs really a solution to this, given that OTAs were never intended to be used for large-scale programs? And uh, luckily, uh, I, I saw a huge trap there, to, and I felt bad for the guy because I, he, he walked right into my trap. And I said, okay, what, 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 was the OT, what are OTAs for? You know, you say they're not for large authorities. Who in the room can say what the first OTA was? Does anyone in this room know? I'm setting my trap again. We got one guy in the back of the room who remembers the first OTA. The other transactional authority was created for one purpose. You guys ready? the Apollo program. It was 3% of US GDP, one OTA. And that really shows that it's, and it's so, you, but, it, but and, and I pointed them out to them, this is a mindset problem. People think OTAs aren't for that. That's not allowed. That's not what the law allows. No, it does. The OTAs can fund 
you know, 3% of US GDP in one program, but there has to be the will. You have to convince them that they want it. You have to prove that it's something they should be taking a bet on. And so that, that's, that's my general bet. We don't, I, I feel like it's a false, a false problem if we get into this idea of like, oh, we need this authority and this new contracting process and this new contracting office. They, it can be done with existing authorities if it's important and if people care. The role Congress can play or should play? Congress plays a huge role because the, the reality is there's, no, you know, there's nothing that the procurement people can do, there's nothing the Pentagon can do if Congress isn't willing to fund it. And if they're not willing to do so in a timely fashion, which several people have talked about today, it's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's also about the speed with which funding can be pushed through. But again, this is a thing where, especially if it doesn't become political, which it sometimes does, uh, if everyone agrees on something, we can make it happen. Shift now to uh, talent, uh, and, and you talked about that, getting, getting young people engaged in, in, in things that matter. Here, here in this state, we see a lot of uh, technical talent, engineering talent, uh, you know, being funneled to semiconductors and alternative energy and electric the electrification of the, the auto industry. How, how do you view the, the kind of the talent landscape, if you will? I don't know if you can be specific to Indiana or not, but generally speaking, how do you view uh, the kind of the talent landscape? Well, the talent landscape is interesting because so many of our, of our universities see their job as to train people what they need to know to be successful in the industry that they're going to be going into. And one of the things that has been very frustrating for me is that you have had so many computer science programs and so many materials engineering programs focus very specifically on things that are relevant to the US consumer and commercial tech industry that almost ensures that their talent will not be going into the military side of things. So like at Stanford University, you'll have computer science courses that are oriented around the tools that the three biggest employers in Silicon Valley are using to build all of their social media applications. Despite those not being you know, secure or scalable or uh, you know, unentangled with Chinese companies, that's what they're teaching them to do. And I would say the, thing, the most important thing when you're building a talent base is to teach people more broadly than that. I personally believe you should not be teaching people, let's say, how to use the latest version of Swift that Facebook happens to be using to build their backend, which is also built on a whole bunch of Chinese microservices. You should be teaching them how to think about computer science holistically, how to think about problems in the right way, how to pick the right tool for the job rather than the tool that happens to be used. And that's a difference in philosophy that I've seen across universities. I'd say here at Purdue, it's actually more at the right end of the scale. As you get closer and closer to these corporate centers and as those corporate centers sponsors these universities more, they turn more into like Google coder training programs as opposed to uh, computer science programs. And this is also a huge problem on the hardware side. Uh, there's a lot of people who are being taught, oh, here's how you should uh, here's how you should engineer a product. Here's how you think about tolerances. Here's how you think about making injection molded parts. And you know what? Those injection molded parts that they're teaching them to design can only be manufactured by Chinese equipment and teams of Chinese, Chinese engineers in China. You're basically equipping them with the tools that they need to make things in a world where China makes everything. And that's also very, very dangerous because you end up with a workforce that doesn't know how to build things. And they also don't know how to build those injection molding, that injection molding equipment correctly. So uh, I, I know I'm sounding like a doom, doom, doomer, gloomer guy up here, but uh, the, the good news is we have universities that are doing that. And what I've seen in Indiana is that people are on the right side of that. They're not just in the Google, Facebook, Microsoft training program to help China make more money off us. Yeah, so you're, you feel good about the talent pipeline here in Indiana uh, overall as you look at the... You well, know, because Indiana is actually making this stuff. You know, yeah. if, if I want to work on yeah. automotive in Indiana, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to be actually manufacturing stuff here. I'm not going to be thinking, how do I make a design package that I send over to an ODM in China and they're mm -hmm. actually going to crank out all of my batteries and all of my wiring mm -hmm. harnesses. Yeah. Um, lessons learned that you can pass along to uh, young entrepreneurs, innovators, or maybe wanted to get into the defense space. I mean, your story is a quintessential entrepreneurial story. What, what would you, uh, advice would you give to young entrepreneurs uh, seeking a path in, in the defense sector? Well, you know, for people who don't know, I started my first company, Oculus VR, when I was 19 years old, and I was living in a camper trailer, putting if myself you would, school. Give, give us that thumbnail, because it's a fascinating <laughs> story. Well, you know, I, I, I was, I'd started working on virtual reality technology as a hobby when I was 15 because I concluded uh, just 
me, myself, and I, that it was not just the next step in computing, but the final step in computing. The only form of computing that could actually emulate every form of the past, the present, and enable you to experience anything that the human mind and body and visual system is capable of experiencing. Uh, which was, I, I really, you know, big, big thought for a 15 year old, but I decided, you know what, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna get to work on VR because nobody really believes in it, but I don't wanna work on the next step. I wanna work on the final thing, even if it's, even if it's gonna take a long time to get there. And it ended up going faster than I thought. I figured out how to build virtual reality headsets that were cheaper and better than anyone had figured out. Uh, and so when I was 19 years old, I dropped out of school and decided to start op Oculus. That went really, really well. I grew that company to 1,400 people. We sold it to, uh, to Facebook for a few billion dollars. And uh, then, 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 then things didn't go well for me. I was there for four years and then they fired me because I gave $9,000 to the, to the wrong, 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 wrong politician. Uh, and uh, you know, you can probably guess who he is. Um, and uh, the the, uh, the advice that I would give to people who are looking at getting into the defense space is to you know, learn, from, learn, from, learn from what I did uh, and then sort of do the opposite. When I started Oculus, it made no rational sense at all. Uh, there, was, there had never been a successful VR company in history. There was no industry for it. It was a thing that I got into for purely head in the clouds, ideological reasons. And I, there are some people where they succeed in that way. Like they become an actor or a musician and then they go and they tell kids, follow your dreams. You can do anything, you can be anything. And they think that's good advice because it worked for them. I had to have a, a hard reckoning with myself post Oculus where I realized that was a one in a million, one in a billion shot. Uh, that, that is, that is I, would, I would not counsel people, typically young people, to bet their entire career and education on something that they are, you know, that they think would be fun, because nine, you know, nine, nine hundred ninety-nine thousand times out of a million, it's just not going. It's not going to work, and and, and it's not going to go anywhere. So I usually encourage people to be rational and be practical, the way I was when I started Android. Say, what are the biggest problems that face our country? What are the biggest problems that my talent set can apply to? Not that I love doing or that it's really fun. You know, if I love painting, uh, you you probably need to say, you know what? It doesn't really matter that you that you love painting. Are you good at painting? Uh, and if you're good at painting, maybe you should paint for your country somehow. But if you're, if, if you're not good at painting, you should probably pick one of the things you are good at and instead focus on that. Um, and you know, there's, there, there are people, who, uh, there, there are people who, who don't like this because they keep saying you know, we, kids should follow their dreams. I do want to let you guys know that I dug into this. I, I asked myself, when did we start telling people this? When did we start telling people, follow your dreams, you could do anything? It's actually a product of the early 1970s. If you look back in Google Scholar and you look at the timelines for when books started to use phrases like follow your dreams, uh, especially in relation to the youth, it was in the early 1970s. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's become a bit kind of a weird feel-good hippie thing. It's basically telling kids, go deeply into debt to do the thing that will never make you money or matter at all. Um, and, and, and this is good advice. And, but, but more importantly, do you guys know what the number one dream was for kids in 1971? Can anyone guess? I know what it is. It, it's astronaut. We had just gone to the moon. And so that's a great dream. I mean, these guys were like fighter pilots, PhD mathematicians, supermen who were also really good looking and well spoken. I mean, they picked them so that they were, you know, they, 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 you know the ultimate American hero ideal. For a kid to see that and say, that's what I want to be, okay, tell the kids to follow their dreams. But do you know what the number one job that kids most want today is? It's a mix of those. Yeah, it's social media influencer. Next is professional gamer. Uh, next is YouTuber. And the problem is when you, you can't tell kids to follow their dreams when their dreams suck. And so <laughs> it, it, it's, it's just the truth. And so I, I, you know, I, I, would, I, I would say if, if you're going to encourage kids to follow their dreams, we need to inspire them in them dreams that are more impactful to them, more impactful to the country, and most importantly, ones that they can practically achieve with the skill set that they have or skill sets they can develop. You know, it doesn't have to be what you're good at today. It has to be what you can become good at. And uh, you, you, you know, become good at something that's going to be good for, good for your country rather than just good for your pocketbook. That's the lesson of the modern American tech industry, I think. Yeah. Great answer. And I think you've kind of answered my next question. Uh, but... Um what would you say, what would be your sales pitch to the great engineering talent coming out of Indiana colleges and universities, Notre Dame, Purdue, trying here in Northeast Indiana, uh, and others, to get them to steer toward, maybe instead of semiconductors, some of those others, steer toward the defense sector? Well, you can make, you can make 
patriotic arguments like, you know, do something that matters. Don't throw away your life. Don't sit on your deathbed really happy about those emojis that you made. Like, you know, th th that, that's one angle you can take with kids. Um, the, the other one that you can take, and this, is, this works better on the ones who would otherwise work on things that do sort of matter. Let's say, you know, energy infrastructure. Um, and, but to, to pull them into defense specifically, uh, I think you can say, listen, you're going to get access to really cool problems that you would not get anywhere else. Um, and it, un, you know, unlike in the past, defense was not the place where the best people went because I think that it was, uh, and I'm, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not trying to be mean here, I'm just saying, like the best people in the tech industry were getting offers from Google, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year straight out of college with incredible benefits. The tech industry just couldn't meet that. And so most people who are not like hyper ideologically motivated to serve their country would end up doing the thing that was best for their family and go to work for these tech companies. Um, the good news is I think tech is on the downswing. Like I, I do not think that the era of massive margins and huge amounts of money flowing around are going to last. Uh, I think that the tech industry is also correcting. You're, we are not in a 0% interest rate world anymore. And I think that that makes defense a much more rational career choice than before. Like if you go into tech assuming that things are going to be the way that they were two years ago or three years ago when your older brother went to go work for Google, you're just wrong. And the defense industry is gonna remain stable. And the third, the most practical one is look at jobs that are gonna be high paying, that are gonna be stable, where you get to work on cool things that matter, that aren't going to be destroyed if we end up even more opposed to China. What happens if we end up in a world where there are sanctions on Chinese products? How many tech companies are gonna be destroyed by that? I mean, look at Apple. They have 95% of their manufacturing in areas that are controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. They could, it, I mean, it, it could be over for them instantaneously. And I would say the defense industry is one that by its very nature cannot be dependent on those foreign powers and is not going to disappear if sanctions come into play. And so I, that, on, on that one practical note alone, I would encourage uh, the, smartest, the smartest kids in tech to not bet their careers on relations with China not deteriorating. That's quite a bet to make. I don't even think that most statesmen are willing to make that bet. So, you know, who, who are you as a, as a teenager to, to, to make the same bet in deciding what to do in school? Final question for you. Uh, you are and have been for so long on the cutting edge, bleeding edge of, of things. What's, uh, as you look at the next, uh, the rest of this year into next year, um, is there a next big thing or is there, is there a big headline you see uh, out there in terms of, uh, of what's ahead? Oh, man. I mean, there's a whole bunch of headlines, like small-scale new, like fission and fusion power. There's so much cool stuff going on. There's so much cool stuff going on on the biological side. Um, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can pick one thing. I guess I'll, I guess I'll, I'll use this as an opportunity to, to shill my, to shill my, my new idea um, that I've been putting around there. I actually think that the underground domain is going to become a new war fighting domain. Uh, it, it, people have not been seriously thinking about it as such for a long time, primarily due to power constraints. The United States during the so Cold War and the Soviets, we both had subterrene programs, building vehicles that could move around underground using nuclear power to achieve the power densities required for such a, such a you know, an energy, energy heavy process. Um, since then, we you know, since it became not cool to build things uh, using nuclear power, and uh, you know, we, we kind of shut down all of the civil nuclear applications that would have really driven that stuff outside of the military. Uh, the, the underground domain has become very limited as a, as a war fighting domain to the point where it's not even listed as 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 one of the primary domains, even though it's actually the biggest one. Uh, except for space. Uh, but you know, there's a whole lot more ground than air, and there's even more ground, uh, ground underground than sea. Um, but I, I think that that's gonna become a war fighting domain be, as it, you know, new, new, new power technology is gonna enable it, new autonomy technology that allows these systems to operate without people in them at much smaller scales. It, you know, it's very hard to build a thing that puts a person in it that also travels through the earth. A lot easier to put something that has AI in it that travels through the earth. Anyway, I know I sound crazy right here, but just file it away in your brain when, you know, we're, 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 gonna, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna have, a, you know, we're gonna have, have I, don't, I don't know if it's gonna be part of the, part of the army, like, like we had the space forces, you know, kind of extension of the air force, you know, our, or is it gonna be its own thing? But I, I, I guarantee at some point we're gonna be here at the Northeast Indiana Defense Summit and we're going to be talking about the, the, the newest and most important, important domain, Palmer, the, the subterrain domain. I, I tell you, I've interviewed a lot of people in my many years, none more fascinating than you. You've got great perspective uh, and really happy that you're continuing to do business in Indiana, investing in Indiana. Thank you for being here. How about a big round of applause for Palmer Lucky?